Hello there, math fans. In this short video, I'm going to talk about the perimeter of an ellipse. I'm not making this to show you a great approximation. It actually turns out to not have that nice of a formula, uh, which is surprising. But I'm doing it because somebody was telling me they were using an elliptical um, object to estimate the value of pi, which was interesting. And somebody else said, could you please post some videos on Taylor series and how you use them? Um, and also, I've been doing a lot of circular motion. So I thought, I better make this short video uh, of how we could approximate the length of an ellipse. I'm not going to do it in the most accurate way. I'm just going to do a little exploration of how you could use Taylor series. And I have one sitting up there right now. But first, we're going to Perry the Husky help us here. Here's an ellipse. I've made it so I can stretch it. I'll introduce a few small terms. I don't want to spend very long here. But let's send Harry around this time. Here we go. And you can parameterize elliptical motion in much the same way we did with circular motion. It's just instead of there being a radius in this spot, and this time I'm making it so you can see my formulas, it's the two numbers A and B. And for this, I'm going to assume that A is bigger. A is how far it is from 0 to the uh, x-intercept. B is how far it is to the y-intercept. And I'm using parametric equations, uh, as I've talked about. So we're going to send them around. The question is, how far did he go? Okay. There is a way to compute it. Those of you that have taken math 125 is what we call it here, or calculus 2, it's this integral. You take the derivative of the first component, which actually is negative sign, but it doesn't change it if I make it negative. I can make this negative. It doesn't change the value. Um, and then you take the square root and you integrate. Students that uh, have taken calculus from me know that the arc length is almost always terrible to compute. <laughs> and so here's another example of the arc length being terrible to compute. And in the case of a circle, it simplifies because you can factor and use an identity. In this case, it doesn't simplify very much. So at this moment, you have this integral we want to compute. And so what do people do? Well, there's a whole bunch of approximations. Um, none of them are that great. Some are clever. So I want to show you a non-clever one. So I am going to do a little bit of manipulation. So I I wrote sine squared as 1 minus cosine squared. I distributed. It's the same integral. You can see it there. Um, and then, so I'm going to get rid of that. It, it, we could go through this or not. It doesn't matter. Um, but I got it all. So there was just cosine squared. Unfortunately, it didn't simplify much more. I then factored out an a squared and rearranged it. Let's just take that as given. I just was showing you those are all the same. Because of this, this is given a name. The square root of that thing, which is typically written in a little different way, is called the eccentricity of a circle. <laughs> You're more eccentric if it's more stretched out. So there's a name for that. Anyways, it's the square, it's this thing. I could write it. Um, you know, you get a common denominator, a to the second minus b to the second. Let's write it here, over a to the second. This is all just, like I said, as soon as things get complicated, we're looking for a way to analyze it. All right, so here we go. So we've got this uh, thing. Hopefully that number is still the same. <laughs> Did I rearrange it in some unusual way? I feel like the number just changed. This should just be a. <laughs> Oh, there, that's all I get for messing things around. Let's see what it, let's go back here to what I had. Is this the same? Oh, yeah, it's the same. <laughs> I doubted myself for a second. Okay, that's why I shouldn't just throw these videos together. All right, so that's the eccentricity there um, of that thing. So then the question becomes, how are we going to approximate this if it's not nice and we'd like to find some general formula? This is a great opportunity for us to use Taylor series, which is one of the main methods that's used in this situation. How are we going to use Taylor series? Well, we have a lot of freedom, a lot, a lot of freedom. And that's what it leads to, well, what's the best approximation? And that's why I thought I would just take an approximation. So. This is one of the Taylor series. We don't talk about this as much in our calculus um, 
three course. This is called the binomial series. You actually probably you you've used it your whole for a long time in your math courses when it's like a square or a cube and expand it out. It also works for other powers, but you have to explain what you mean by the binomial coefficient. But let's just ignore the notation for a second. In order to use Taylor series, you don't need the notation. The notation ultimately is very helpful, and it's nice if you can use it. But for this discussion, let's just talk about someone gives you this. Now, if you've taken Math 126, you know you can get the first few terms from a derivative. So even if you didn't know the pattern, you could get it. And here are the first few terms. So I put a t squared. I'll explain why in a second. And a half. And there's the first few terms. Turns out it's not very hard to get this. You can actually, I've got a few things ready here. You can ask for the Taylor series on almost any, because these are so valuable, they're encoded into any online calculator. So here I'm saying I want the Taylor series for this. It gives me this. If I'm unhappy, I can ask for more terms. There you go. This becomes an essential approximation that we can use for complicated things. It's turning our function into a polynomial. Okay, so let's come back. So there's the Taylor series. So how in the world am I going to use this to approximate my integral? Again, there's lots of ways to do that. But what I'm going to do is this. Let's get rid of this. And I just do a little rearranging. Let's hold this up here. That's the Taylor series for our square root function. And then I'm going to step into what we have. So the integral we have is this. And I'll make this a little smaller. So the integral we have is this. We can think of it as a times the integral. And this is not the best or cleanest or most exact way. But we could write it this way. Something squared dt. In that spot is going to be this thing we're calling, this is the square of the eccentricity. They usually use E in books, but it was so confusing to me to use E because we use it for something else. So in this spot, I'm going to have C times cosine of T. Now, maybe it's confusing to have C there. So I'm going to plug this in to all of these spots. You might say, why are you doing that? Well, there's no other. I mean, the nice ways of doing it, the approximations we get, um, for the integral or in lots of ways. But if you're trying to find a general formula that involves A and B, this would give you a way to try to think about it. This is how people, so sometimes students don't get this. They're like, well, if you can approximate just using a online integrator, why would you use Taylor series? Well, Taylor series can do the things like this. They can analyze it if you don't know what A and B are and give you some information about the formula. Okay, so I did that. I plugged it in to that Taylor series. Again, this is not an optimal way to do this. I'm not claiming it is. And I'm going to show you what I got. And let's Harry's still spinning. <laughs> He's probably getting dizzy. Okay, so uh, here we go. So I plugged it in. So I plugged in in all these spots. Just like I said I was going to. Okay. And then I can integrate each one term by term. Now, if this doesn't approach very quickly, it's going to be bad. And that's where error bounds and the other things come into play. But I can integrate this. The integral of 1 is just going to be 2 pi. So this is a times 2 pi. The next one is going to be negative 1 half c squared times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine squared. And those of you that took calculus 2 know that that integral can be done. And then we have another one. And these integrals come up a lot. That's why you did them in Math 125. Cosine to the fourth. In fact, you can even prove like a recursion for how to get those values. So for now, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show you. So here's the eighth power one. You should know that half angles can give you that. And let me scroll this up a little bit. And you can see it's 35 pi over 64. So we can get all those integrals. Again, we're not, we, we could try to find the pattern. That's much harder. But if you're just trying to get the first few terms or an approximation, there you go. Okay, so that's just a, a little exploration of how we could use Taylor series. Okay, let's finish this off as follows. So I'm going to move a few things here. Let's make this a little smaller. Apologies. 
I'm just try, trying to throw this together real quick. <laughs> Answer those couple questions before I go and do real work here. <laughs> okay, so I did this. I plugged in those values I got. Harry, would you move, please? All right. And this is what I got. And it's a big mess. People go, why would this be helpful? But this gives you an approximation. So then I went through and I replaced C with its formula. And I got this. And there we go. There's a, a formula you could give someone and say, you give me A and B. Now I truncated it at two. The question then becomes evaluating this, meaning is this helpful? Does this give me something close to the value? If it does, then we have like a formula. If it doesn't, then we need to adjust it and make it better. This is an approximation the moment I truncated it. Okay, so I typed it in. I typed in the first several terms. It looks like I went a little further. Oh, to eight. And it's okay. I'm a little unhappy with it. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to, my goal here is not to find the best approximation. My goal is to show you how Taylor series could be used. So then I just like, all right, let's make the video now. <laughs> so I got 15.60 and the actual value using some other approximation technique that the system uses is 5.58. So there's our, oops, I better keep that in there. There's our comparison. So anyways, you could then play the game of, can I rearrange this and make it look pretty, which people have done. So I'll finish this with a little uh, survey of some of what I found online. All right, here, we're gonna send you away for a second. Um, this is just a random math fun website where they talk about this and they go through several approximations people have used, but I hope this gave you a sense of how it's done. So one approximation that's sometimes given is this, now, if I rearrange my approximation, it's not quite the same as that. Um, so they make various assumptions by plugging in different things to the Taylor series or rearranging. A uh, famous mathematician uh, from India who, the story is he had access to only a basic uh, calculus book and then did some amazing things based off of that alone and then wrote to... Uh, uh, mathematician in England, uh, G.H. Hardy, who recognized, he wrote to a bunch of mathematicians, but Hardy was the one to recognize that his work really was impressive and call, and invited him. Anyways, there's a long history. That's Ramanujan. You might have heard of him in some way. So he made a lot of these formulas because he thought about a lot of these kind of calculus, pre-calculus questions a lot. And he did it by being clever. So instead of plugging in what we plugged into the Taylor series, he plugged in something else. And by rearranging, you can try to set it up in such a way that that the numbers get smaller faster when you plug them in, which will give you a better approximation. And got this approximation, which is supposedly a really good one. So pi times a plus b. So again, a little different than our formula because it's been rearranged. Plus times 1 plus this age, all this other stuff. But this other stuff, sorry, let me scroll so you can see it. This other stuff is really small okay and then they talk about taylor series they say there's that eccentricity they like to use the number e here they actually make it look complicated that's why i didn't want to do that because i thought it would be a distraction um but they are a little clever about it so you can see it's not obvious how to use the taylor series but the point of this was to show you the taylor series is a useful tool and in this they do a bunch of um approximations they show that Ramanujan's approximation is pretty darn good. Um, I think it's the best of them. So that just gives you a taste for how Taylor series is a very useful tool in situations where we don't have a nice formula and we want to analyze it and get some approximation formula that then we can use forever. This happens in physics and engineering all the time where we take something complicated we replace it with some Taylor series. Sometimes the approximation is really good. And we say, okay, we can basically use this to replace the more complicated formula. Sometimes it's not that good, like in this case. And so then we say, well, we need to qualify how good is it? What can we say about the errors? So I, I hope that was interesting to, our, to anyone that might be listening. All right.